Welcome to the National <coughs> Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists and the place where news happens. I'm Mike Friedman, a member of the National Press Club Board of Governors, and I also have the privilege of serving as executive producer of the Calb Report public right. broadcasting <coughs> series moderated by the gentleman to my left. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to remind our audience that you can share your thoughts on tonight's headliners book wrap by tweeting. Please use the hashtag NPCLive. This evening, we are honored to welcome legendary journalist Marvin Kell, senior advisor to the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, moderator of the Cal Report series for the past 25 years. Uh, former CBS and NBC News chief diplomatic correspondent, former moderator of Meet the Press, and as I always consider it a privilege to say, the last correspondent personally hired at CBS News by the patron saint of broadcast journalism, Edward R. Murrow. <laughs> Marvin joins us this evening to discuss his new book, Enemy of the People, Trump's War on the Press, the new McCarthyism, and the threat to American democracy. Please join me in welcoming Marvin Kapp. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marvin, I'd like to begin with two observations. The first is from USA Today Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page, who said, this administration has been more restrictive and more challenging to the press more dangerous to the press, really, than any administration in American history. The second is from James Risen, who wrote in the New York Times, it is the most secretive White House that I have ever been involved in covering. I think the president hates the press. Both of these quotes referred to the administration of Barack Obama. <laughs> so Marvin, what's different about Donald Trump? In my judgment, what is different about Trump is that by his words and by his actions, both, he has weakened the underlying fabric of American democracy. Trump may feel it to his immediate political advantage to attack the press. Fine. Every president does that. That isn't the issue. With Trump, he is doing something that is deeper than that. When he attacks the press, he is attacking, in my judgment, the foundation of American democracy. I have always believed that there are two foundational structures that hold aloft the concept of democracy. One of them is what Ed Murrow called the sanctity of the courts, the idea that no one is above the law. The other is the freedom of the press. And it is my experience, um, I don't know whether it's shared by that many people, but it is my experience having traveled around the world, having covered nations everywhere, that when a government attacks the press to the point of belittling it and humiliating it and trying to make it seem as if it is something different from the structure of the government, not the government itself, but the, the nature of our society. That is a frightened government. That is a government that is afraid of criticism. That is a government that is fearful of a free press. And that is generally a dictatorship or some form of authoritarian government. And so whenever a president goes simply in my judgment, beyond where he should go, beyond where other presidents have gone. He is endangering the structure of our democracy, and it worries me a great deal. I am, for the first time in my life, frightened by the actions of an American president. This president seems to have gone from sparring with the press, as many previous <clears throat> leaders have done, to using it as a punching bag to invigorate mm -hmm. his base. And you are saying that you've never seen anything like this before? I never have, president? no. And, and I have to quickly uh, talk about Richard Nixon here. Uh, whenever, whenever I talk to people about 
this particular president, they always raise the issue, what about Nixon? I mean, he was just as bad or worse. And in many ways, he was worse. Um, Richard Nixon had a certain relationship with this reporter, which was unusual and somewhat strained. Uh, because of my reporting on the Vietnam War, Richard Nixon did not like me. And so what did he do? He uh, tapped our phone, broke into my office down here in Washington twice, uh, tailed me during the Paris peace talks, um, put me on his personal enemies list. He did a lot of things, and yet, because I knew that Nixon was a highly professional, skilled politician, in many ways except one big one. Um, this was a man who had been elected in 1946 to the House of Representatives in 1948, I believe, or 52 to the Senate, uh, then vice president for eight years, president of the United States for five years. I mean, here was a guy who was a thoroughly professional politician. He knew what was going on, and he hated the press, and he would take action against the press, but for one reason or another, I never believed. I never believed that he would undermine the government of the United States. I could be terribly wrong on that, very naive, and during the Q&A period, you can all take me apart on it. <laughs> But I never believed it. I do believe that about Trump. And that, why, that is why, for me, Trump is in a league of his own, and it's not a desirable league to be in. CNN's White House correspondent, Jim Acosta, has had his White House press credential pulled by the president, uh, which has resulted in a lawsuit um, by his network. What do you make of this, and how can the journalistic community best respond to this type of treatment? Well, so far, what the journalists have been doing is sending notes of support in, and that is, of course, a very good thing. Um, I am not comfortable with the idea of journalism organizing itself into some kind of institution to take on a president of the United States, I'm very uncomfortable with that. And I'm not even sure it's practical. But the idea of journalists standing up and saying, we are in support of that reporter's right to report, I think that is terrific. And um, there is going to be a decision, it is my understanding anyway, at 10 o'clock tomorrow that Judge Kelly is going to make up his mind about whether um, the White House is going to get its way, or CNN will get its way. And if I had to bet now, I think that CNN is going to win this phase of the argument because it's very hard to take the contrary position um, on a legal matter. For example, the president has every right in the world to say, I don't want you in my house out you go. If the person represents a demonstrable national security threat in some way or another, a personal threat to the president or his family, if that is to be the case, the president has a right of responsibility to get rid of that person and the Secret Service will take care of him. But in this particular case, the president took action based solely on his dislike of a reporter. Well, you don't have to like, as I said before, Nixon hated the press. Uh, Trump probably also hates the press, but with Trump it's different. That's why he's such an interesting character. I think that Trump has a love-hate relationship with the press. I think he wants to feel as he did when he was a big shot real estate guy in New York, that he could move from Queens to Manhattan, and if he could win over the New York Times, he had arrived. And he would do all kinds of things to play with the press, but he needed the press. He needed it for his own ego, and he needed it to advance very much his vision of himself. 
policy, his business interests, family, all of that. That is, that's, that's one thing to think of the press as a useful agent to advance your interest. It is another thing to take action against the press. This is, to the best of my knowledge, the first action that this president has taken, aside from words. And a lot of people, Mike, will say, who cares about words? Mm -hmm. Words are meaningless, but they're not. Words have enormous power. When they come from the lips of the President of the United States, that's big time stuff. There's a school of thought out there that perhaps <clears throat> the White House press corps should boycott the White House and should walk out. What would be the consequences of that type of action? I don't know what the consequences would be, but I think it's the dumbest idea that I've heard in a long time. I think it's a very, very bad thought for, uh, it's counterproductive, first of all. You could not organize the modern day press is composed of so many independent operations. With the internet having given birth, having spawned um, multiple press operations, it would be impossible for all of them to gather together and agree on a single action. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So I think it could never work. If you were going to say, well, supposing it was just the New York Times and the Washington Post that did something. Yeah, something could happen, but neither one would do it. And um, I don't like the idea of, of the headline being written, CNN against President Trump. I don't think the press is in the business of going to war against a president. This president is at war with the press. But the press should not be doing anything more than covering the president, not be at war with the president. That's not our job. Does the lack of public response to what's happened surprise you in any way? It does not surprise me, no. I think that there is, I think, you know, Walter Cronkite, who was the great anchorman at CBS. Walter was once asked a question about whether the press should do things together. And he answered by saying something like, I don't remember the exact words, but the idea was um, if the press is under fire from the White House, president especially, only the press can be counted on to defend the press. And one of the reasons for that is that ever since Richard Nixon's time, the press has been under attack by conservatives consistently. And it might not have happened. I remember Lyndon Johnson being furious with some of us again on the Vietnam War. And he would say all kinds of things, cursing, screaming, um, denouncing, me, I remember one telephone conversation with President Johnson that left me trembling. I was so nervous about one of the things that he said that I was personally responsible for the death of American soldiers in Vietnam by a broadcast that I had done. There was no evidence for that as it turned out and it was wrong, but he, was, he, he wanted to frighten me and he did. It didn't mean that he stopped me from reporting, but that moment I was trembling in, in just fear that I had hurt somebody. Um, Cronkite said that only reporters will really help other reporters, that the public is perfectly happy to watch it, to watch a collision between the press and the president as a show, and that you watch it because it, everything happens on television now. You can watch it on your cell phone. Um, we're absorbed with, with that kind of stuff. Um, 
I am not at all surprised that there is not tremendous outrage because some people may like Jim Acosta and some people may not. So are we, as journalists, we're here at the National Press Club, playing to a degree into the president's hands. Some say he sees his presidency as a reality show that must have conflict with enemies, and he must come out the hero. Um, he does it over and over, day in, day out, and it doesn't seem to make any difference to his base of supporters that he does this. Um, should the news media continue to function in this role, in this reality program? I don't know what they can do different. Mm -hmm. um, um, I understand the, the motivation behind your question. It's a good question. But I am not sure that when you accept the fundamental purpose of the press, it is there to cover the news. It's not a mystery. They're not involved in plots and all kinds of things. They're there to cover the news. And we make something because of our bent toward conspiracy these days, we make things far more complicated than they really are. Journalists have a simple job to do. Go out there and find out what's going on and tell me about it. But because of the power of the press, we sort of stand above that simple definition. And because of the power of television and cameras and lights and, and the whole internet world in which we live today, the role of journalism has risen beyond, I think, where it should be. It's become too much of an actor in a political drama involving a president who has never had, up until the time he was president, never served this country in any way. He was never in the military, never had any political, never was on the school board, never did any of that stuff. He decided he wanted to be president of the United States and given an incredibly skillful PR operation. I regard Donald Trump as one of the most effective hucksters in American history. <laughs> he has managed to sell himself and all of his ideas. And for me, the sad part is that clearly 30 to 40 percent of the American people buy into what it is that President Trump is selling, and they apparently like it, and that's fine. They can like it, um, but then that would mean that there are about 60 percent of the American people who have a different view. We'll see how that struggle eventually ends, but at the moment it is intense. And I am not sure, you didn't ask this question, but I'll kind of answer my own. I'm not sure whether if President Trump was obliged to leave office in one way or another, I think he's not going to retire. Uh, President Trump makes a very big point of the fact that he has 55 million people listening to his tweets, reading his tweets. He, he tells reporters quite openly, I don't need you anymore. I've got my own network. And given the, the, the newness of the technology, we don't yet know the degree to which control over 55 million tweets is in itself, if put to bad purpose, something to be worried about? Or is it simply that he's got 55 million people who, who connect with him? He's not going to go into retirement quietly. He's not that sort of person. He's going to fight back. And he's going to make life difficult. Um, and I think that that is one of the dangers that I see in his highly personalized style of governance. You discuss McCarthyism yes. and the impact Edward R. Murrow had 
<clears throat> in helping to both break the blacklist of the 1950s and end the siege of Senator McCarthy and his allies. And it's a really substantive section of, of the book, Enemy of the People. What do you see as the lessons learned from that which can be applied today? People have asked me in a different way that same question when they ask, is there an Edward R. Murrow today? And the answer is no. There is no Murrow today, and there cannot be a Murrow today. Murrow would not be hired by CBS today. And there is not a reporter who had that kind of background, that kind of appeal, and also at that level of technological development. Um, at that time, we had, you know, three networks, and there were two major news magazines in the week, and various newspapers. And that was it. Um, people looked toward Murrow for leadership, which today would be an almost impossible thing to duplicate. Walter Cronkite, in the 1980s, um, had an 83 percent approval rating. Not as an anchor man, as an American citizen. Who is the most trusted man in America today was the question. And Walter got it with 83%. Can you imagine any journalist today, any, pick them, who would have even a 13% approval rating? It just doesn't exist. We're not in that world any longer. It's a new set of rules that we're living by. And Murrow had this phenomenal ability. I think that the conclusion of his broadcast on March 9th, 1954, when he took on McCarthy, was one of the most brilliant editorials ever done on television. And he did it at a time when networks did not allow editorials, but Murrow could do it. Today, everybody has editorials, and so they have lost their clout, their power. Murrow was so special that his editorial really had clout. And Murrow took on McCarthy for a reason that's very much, to your question, Mike, related to what is happening today. Murrow was a reporter who, as many of you know, uh, covered the rise of fascism in Germany in the 1930s. And Murrow was astonished that German friends of his, people he knew very well in, say, 1935, people with whom he went to a concert, or people who would write books, uh, people who he enjoyed being with, that within three years these people were Gestapo chiefs, and killing Jews, and killing reporters, and killing anybody they didn't like. And he, he couldn't grasp that. And it frightened him that it could happen that quickly in a completely civilized society. So when Murrow saw McCarthy rising as a threat in 1951, and then 52 really, 53 big time. He was in his mind already doing editorials for his radio program and doing a number of pieces for his television program called See It Now. And he was planning that big program on March 9th. And what's very interesting, again, it, Murrow saw the beginning, no, let me, for, Murrow saw what he feared could be the beginning of an authoritarian rule in the United States under a senator like Joe McCarthy. Eisenhower could have, when he took power in 1953, Eisenhower could have moved and got rid of McCarthy overnight, but he wouldn't do it. Because like everybody else, he was concerned that he would also be called a communist. And he didn't want to get into that. He said, I don't want to get into the gutter with that guy. 
I can fully understand that, but somebody was looking to somebody had to take on McCarthy, and it ended up being a journalist who took him on. So jumping to today, could there be a Murrow today? No, in my judgment. Therefore, what could take on, if, if we are right that there is a, a rising authoritarian possibility in the United States, how do you take that on? How do you say enough is enough? Well, one way is through the ballot box. And something happened a week ago which would indicate that the American people do have the capacity to stop him. But is it enough? And what will he do now? What other ideas could come into his mind that he would like to move on? The idea that you can appoint your own attorney general as if he is your personal attorney rather than the chief law enforcement officer in the United States. So there, I don't see um, um, an immediate, there's no Murrow type. So where does the opposition come from? The American people, ballot box, and the collective strength of a free press. If we have, Mike, if we continue to have in this country, <clears throat> a free and unafraid press, we're going to have our freedom. It's not going to be taken away. It can't be taken away. I am, in a way, sick and tired of hearing people complain about the press, criticize the press, denounce the press. I mean, Trump can do his thing. That's not my immediate worry. I worry about so many people who seem to share that view I think the press is a miracle. When a newspaper comes out every morning, think about what it takes to put a newspaper out. Have you any idea of the complexity, the wonder of having stories come in from all over the world? There are people looking out and providing information for you so that you know what's going on in Iran. That is a fascinating operation and it is a wonder of a free country to have a free press. You have a free press then we're all free people. So taking everything you've just said together, is it conceivable <coughs> that where there is no individual given the digital nature of information sharing today, gathering and sharing, that perhaps the combination of the New York Times and the Washington Post together <coughs> form the basis of a Murrow today? I play with that idea quite often. Um, and I think it's, a, it's kind of a nice, has a nice structure to it. And as you well know, on the Calv Report, we have the two editors of those papers. And they're going to be honored by the National Press Club once again in a few weeks. And I think that each one loves to be part of a joint, um, joint praise. They both absorb it fine. But you remember we asked, would you guys go out, would you guys work together to try to take on Trump? And they both leap back from that. Right. They don't want to have anything to do with that. And they said it right. They're just there to cover the news. They're not there to engage in a war. So I'm not sure that the Post and the Times together is, again, a practical kind of operation any more than I think the press can all get together and say, Mr. Trump, no more. We, as reporters, we tend to think of ourselves as too important. I wish that were not the case. I wish that reporters could go back to doing things. I mean, I've been at this thing for so long now that I remember how it was when you simply covered the news. And if you got a story, and you got it on the Cronkite News, or you got it in your newspaper, you said to yourself, damn, I did a good job today. 
I can now go home and have two drinks and a great dinner <clears throat> and feel very proud of yourself. Now, with evening cable and everybody wanting to get on television and there's the power of television, um, some of our very, very best journalists you see on the evening cable news programs, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a good idea? What do you think? I don't know. Well, we'll hopefully get to that in the Q&A um, <laughs> yeah. with you. I have three or four more questions I'd like to ask, and we have only a few minutes before we turn it over to our audience okay. for, uh, for questions. Our mutual friend, Laura King of the yes. Los Angeles Times, um, on your recommendation, participated in a panel discussion about the press in oh, Warsaw, Warsaw, Poland right. uh, a few months ago and was challenged by members of the local press with comments like fake news. They yelled at the Western journalists who were there. So it appears this is spreading at this point. Talk about that for a moment. Um, number one, the, the concept of fake news is not a Trump creation. It's been around for a long, long time. But he seized on something that has been gestating in the body politic of America really since the Nixon years. And if you were to put it on a chart, you could see the graph just gradually going up to measure the uh, intensity of anti-press feeling and sentiment among the American people. And it became part of the Republican um, attitude toward the media to be on the opposition side, to be able to criticize the press with the knowledge that you will be able to get several political cookie points by attacking the press. And, and they were proving that. And the press was associated with the loss of the Vietnam War. And there were a lot of people in this country who believed that the United States would never have lost that war. The press lost that war. Well, of course, that's an absolutely idiotic idea, but it was in the minds of a lot of people. And those people, um, became the foundation and support for the, the rising conservative movement. And when Roger Ailes, who in so many ways was a genius at PR, established the Fox cable news operation in 1996, same year, by the way, that MSNBC got started. When Roger Ailes started that, he knew that he was reaching into a body part of American political opinion that was so angry with the press for Watergate and the Vietnam War that they had a built-in audience. And he established that, Mike, within a matter of six years. Fox News was drawing a larger audience than any other cable operation and sometimes on election night, more than the three established networks. He had that kind of insight into the mind of the American people, and he turned Fox into the giant that it is today. President Trump, every now and then, in a revealing moment, will say that 91% of the, of the press is fake news, produces fake news, 91%. 9% is Fox, and that's good news. But 91 is bad. So what he is saying is, um, to those people who would like to believe him, that almost every single thing you read or see is fake. It's not real. And the idea caught. It caught here in the United States. 31% of the American people today agree with the president that the press is the enemy of the people. No, the press is not the enemy of the people. 
The politicians who put that baloney out are the enemy of the people. The press is the, it sounds corny perhaps, but I truly believe if you have a free press, you're going to be free. And countries all over the world today, drop that phrase, certain countries all over the world today, Poland, Hungary, Italy in its new guise. We don't know exactly what's going to happen with England after Brexit gets into play. Russia, China, Philippines. There are, uh, right recently, Brazil. There is a movement underway. It is an international movement. That's the spooky part of it. An international movement that fastens on to ideas such as a fake news, enemy of the people. What does that enemy of the people mean? Where did the expression come from? Trump, I do not believe that President Trump is aware of the historical origin of the phrase, enemy of the people. But it comes from way back in the Roman days. The rulers that did not do a good job were declared to be enemies of the people, and they were dispensed with many by death. Uh, during the French Revolution, same idea. Uh, those people who were not for the revolution, get rid of them, kill them. They were all enemies of the people. In the 20th century, starting with Mussolini, then quickly Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, the dictators of the 20th century were the ones who used the expression enemy of the people to attack the press, political dissidents, anybody who objected to what it is that governing authority objected to. And I have a feeling that the president, not knowing that, fastened onto it because Believe it or not, Pat Cadell, some of you may remember Pat, he was a, was a sort of left of center, brilliant pollster who helped Jimmy Carter become president in 1976. Pat was then very much of the left. He has swung way over to the right. And he began to write for Breitbart. And Steve Bannon was the head of Breitbart. Steve picked up the expression that Pat Cadell used against the American press, calling them enemies of the press. Told the president about, the president liked it, used it, and that's how he got it. It's an odd origin for him, but I don't believe for an instant that the president is aware <laughs> that he is keeping company, historically, with some of the worst people that you're gonna find anywhere in any book. So, the expression is a dangerous expression to use. It has an ugly history. Nikita Khrushchev, interesting story. Nikita Khrushchev in 1956, at the time of the 20th Party Congress in Moscow, attacked Joseph Stalin, which was a big deal to do. He attacked Joseph Stalin for a number of reasons, one of which was that Stalin used the expression, enemy of the people. And Khrushchev, a devout communist, attacked another devout communist for using the expression enemy of the people because he thought it was wrong. He thought it was not only morally wrong, but politically wrong. And here was the president of the United States using that expression. And that was the reason, Mike, as you well know, when this, thing got, this book got started, because of the expression being used by a president of the United States on February 17, 2017, for the first time, but many times since then. And that first thought that ran through my mind was Khrushchev saying that about Stalin. And he was the president saying that about what? The New York Times, CBS, CNN, come on. I'll take us back a few years as we wrap up this portion of the program. In 1734, Peter Zenger, editor of the no New York Weekly Journal. No matter how old Journal. I am, Mike, I didn't cover that. <laughs> <laughs> he was editor of the uh, New York Weekly Journal. 
<laughs> he was arrested and charged with seditious libel for writing about corruption involving the colonial governor. Um, in what became a landmark decision for freedom of the press, it was determined that truth could be used as a defense. So here we are in 2018. We seem to be questioning the very definition of the word truth with the introduction by this administration of the phrase alternative facts, uh, the apparent use of doctored video in the Jim Acosta scenario, the constant cry of fake news to describe legitimate journalism, and as you point out, the repeated description of reporters as the enemy of the people. So just a, a two-part question. So where does this leave us right now? And is there a point in time when all of this moves from a matter of concern to a crisis? What do you mean by that last question? A lot of people are concerned right now about where we may be headed. Oh. The question is, how far along this path are we? And at what point do we hit a moment when we are changed? I don't know the answer to that question, but I live in, a, in an anxious world. Um, Somewhere in this book is the story of a speech that Justice William Douglas delivered um, way back in 1976. And Douglas um, was very concerned about the state of American democracy after Watergate and after the Vietnam War. And he did this speech because he was asked to do it on behalf of a group of lawyers from the state of Washington. And I'll probably do a disservice to the late justice, but let me do the best I can in trying to describe uh, what the justice had in mind, and I think it may be an answer to your question. Um, Douglas said that political systems do not change overnight. There is not a moment when a democracy becomes an authoritarian state or a dictatorship. It happens in his mind over a period of time. And the people watching this transition from one phase to another um, are puzzled as they move along this path. Because he breaks it into three parts. In the first path, you get up in the morning and the bedroom looks very uh, familiar to you. You dress in a certain way. You take a car to work or a, a bus or whatever, everything looks the same. The sun is shining, the roads are clear, Connecticut Avenue is fine. <laughs> and then you get into the middle of this progression. And in the middle, everything continues to look the same way, except in the pit of your stomach, you know that something has changed. You don't know quite what it is, you're not sure. Um, you just know something is changing. And then you move on to the third phase. And the third phase for Douglas broke into two parts. That after you've gone through this very uncomfortable feeling where everything looks the same, but you know it isn't, and you emerge one day, and the sun is shining, and everything is fine. And you say to yourself, dummy, what were you so worried about? Everything is fine. That's great. You have a drink, and you're in good shape. But supposing you move into that third phase, and it is dark. And Douglas said, you have become the unwitting victims of the darkness, that you had a chance in that middle phase, knowing something was going on, you couldn't identify it quite, but something in the pit of your belly was moving in such a way that you knew there was a problem. You had your chance to do something, 
but you didn't. And you are now the unwitting victim of the darkness. So how far along are we as a nation? Perhaps we'll all wake up tomorrow morning and the sun will be shining and everything will be fine. Um, I don't think so, but I could be dead wrong. But my experience, uh, my running around the world, my whatever, leads me to believe that there is something this president is doing which is different um, for me frightening. I don't want my children or grandchildren to be stuck in darkness. I want them to be able to appreciate the bright sunshine that I've had all of my life. Um, and so I felt the need as a citizen um, to write something about this. And that was the, that was the point I mean, that's the point of the book, to be able to, to get it off my chest. And if I'm wrong, so I'm wrong. Won't be the first time I could show you of that. But there's something in the pit of my stomach that I'm a bit of a witch. And I think there is something going on that we all know about. We just haven't placed the same weight of concern on it. And finally, what do you hope will be the, the takeaway for the people once they've read your book? To know that there is something going on now which is wrong, which is potentially very dangerous. Trump, as I was trying to imply before, Trump is not... Um, the origin of this anxiety. Trump has cleverly exploited the anxiety to push himself and his own interests as far as they can go. But this is something happening all over the world. We are at a, at a rather, <coughs> excuse me, we're at <coughs> an historic moment. A hundred years ago, World War I ended <clears throat> with, with the idea of a League of Nations, the idea that together we can take on all of the problems of the world and possibly solve them, possibly. And then you went to the United Nations, and you had the feeling that through collective security, the whole idea of NATO, the whole idea of the EU, all of these ideas of bringing people together to accomplish major issues. I think we are now at the end of that period and something new has opened up. And we don't know quite because it's the beginning of something historic. You, when you're at the beginning of history, you, you can get a feel for it, but you don't know the true shape of it until it happens. And it hasn't happened yet. It's happening. It's a process that is underway. And in America, we're the leaders in so many ways all over the world. We can stop it. We have that capacity. Will we? We may not have a specific Murrow today but you certainly do and have this evening eloquently channeled your mentor with well, your thank you, words. Man. Thank you. And thank I, think, I think Ed Murrow would be very proud of you. Thank you. At this point. Um, thank you, Marvin. Um, it's time for your questions. If, um, <coughs> if you have a question, <coughs> our colleague Bob Ludwig has a microphone. And if you'll raise your hand, Bob will bring the microphone to you <coughs> so we can capture your question on video. And it will be part of the package. We have a question. There's a question up, right Bob. here, Bob. I'm Viola Ginger. Um, thank you very much for doing this and for writing the book. <coughs> Why do you think it is so hard for a people, whether it was in Germany in the 30s or in Hungary, more, much more recently, perhaps Poland, the Philippines, here 
to to understand um, the direction that things are going and how far <laughs> down the path we are. Is it a failure of imagination? We just don't imagine it could possibly be that bad? I don't think it's a failure of imagination. There's when when we move into something new, there is a fear component. Maybe fear, not for everybody, anxiety for most people, that you know something is going on. Something is different, something is new. But you're not quite sure what it is. And because you're not sure of what it is, you don't want to jump too far in front. And so you cool it um, a bit. Um, I used to have a professor many years ago named Crane Brinton. Um, he was an expert on the French Revolution. And I remember that he said that when you are in the middle of a revolution, you often don't know exactly what is happening around you, except there's chaos and change. But you don't know where the chaos goes, how far it will go, toward what end. Um, that you need 20, 30, 40 years to be able to look back and say to yourself, ah, that's what it was. But you don't have that ah moment at the time it is happening. And I think that's where we are now in this country and where this country is with respect to the broader movement away from a collective response to a problem and toward what President Trump calls a nationalist response to a problem. French President Macron said the other day, last weekend, that I don't have his exact words in mind, but the idea was that nationalism is wrong at this time. This is not where we should be going. We should be thinking about a collective response. You know, think about something, um, the fires out in California, the floods in Houston and the storms in Puerto Rico. Um, sure, this might all have happened 100 years ago, too, but not as speedily as they are happening now. Something is going on, um, and we ought to be responding to it. Thank you. A question in the back. Marvin, thank you for a great presentation and a wonderful book. Thank you. Can you, uh, in your over now 50 years in journalism, uh, if I may, point to an administration in recent American history that you prefer, uh, that did a great job with media relations and did a great job with the media in general, and what are some of the things they did that maybe this administration ought to be doing? Um, I don't think you know this, but I was at a dinner the other night in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was asked that very question. <laughs> So you didn't know it. Right. Um, I'll try to give this a little better answer than I gave the other night because I've been able to think about it a little bit. I don't think there is a single president or a single administration that, in my judgment, has been able, in a satisfactory way, to address all of the central problems this nation faces. But there are administrations that have been able to take on some large issues and do it very well. For example, George H.W. Bush, 1991, faced the end of the Cold War, the breakup of the Soviet Union, a big, dangerous nuclear power, was able to take the division of Germany at the heart of Europe and bring that together he pulled that off without war. Um, I think that was one of the most remarkable um, exercises of experience and wisdom in the conduct of American foreign policy that I have ever seen in my life. Um, maybe I would back off a little bit and say the victory in World War II was better than that. But nevertheless, big time stuff. On domestic policy, no one in my mind approaches Lyndon Johnson as somebody who could pass, cut to what is at the heart 
of America's illness for 250 years, which is racism. And he cut to the heart of that with legislation. He was able to push that through the Congress. And I think that was a brilliant stroke. And so for me, I want to take a little bit of this president and a little bit of that president. Lyndon Johnson was destroyed by the Vietnam War. Destroyed. Um, George Bush, George H.W. Bush, was destroyed by having said something dangerous like taxes may have to come up a little bit. Um, so that destroyed him on the domestic side. So I don't know that we have had a president um, who has been able to do both all that well, because let us face it, this is a very complex country, and we live at a very complex time. Yeah. Other Tim. questions? Uh, it's Tim Carrington, and my question relates to the media other than the mainstream media that is so much the target of presidential attacks. And I'm thinking about a BBC interview that came about six months after Trump's election. And here's this kind of chirpy British reporter convening a focus group of voters in Kentucky and asking them about their information sources. And they all wanted to be informed. They, you know, they were American citizens that wanted to know what was going on. This is the basis for the press. Uh, and she asked them what they read. And they said, well, what we don't read are the New York Times and the Washington Post and these, you know, we're not going to read those because they're, you know, they're, they're biased and they're wrong and they're not telling us things that are true. So she said, you know, you guys are really tough customers. Uh, what <laughs> do you read? Um, and they said, well, we go on the Internet um, and we have Facebook and we have all kinds of interesting stuff that comes our way by that. And... You know, she said, well, is that stuff edited or are, you, uh, are people asking the question of that information? Is this true? Um, and they didn't really know and they didn't really care. They were excited by it. It made them feel they were, um, you know, part of something that the mainstream was missing. So I think that a part of this whole thing is people who, say, believe that our uh, elections are flawed by uh, millions of illegal people voting who are not citizens. Um, now, they hear that on news reports, not in the mainstream media, but various other places. And they are devoted um, absolutely without, without worry about the source of that information. And I think that, that's a part of this mix, isn't it? That, absolutely, and you said it so well, and thank you, Tim, on that. Um, it's part of the, the large problem that we have. We, we have many large problems. That's one of them. Um, it denies the American people, in a way, a common uh, source of information. Because if the right will be satisfied only with Fox and whatever it is that they can find on their iPhone. And a lot of other people um, are happiest watching Rachel Maddow at night and feeling that she provides that essential bit of information that is comforting. And then Laura Ingram satisfies that other percent of the American people. Um, we have a, a particular problem in that it raises a question of which news is reliable enough for all of us. And we don't have that now. So we have lost uh, over the last 20 years a, a place where we could all comfortably go uh, to find out what's going on in the world or in our country. Uh, but you're so right. There is, a, there is a feeling of false comfort 
derived from finding something on your iPhone that meets your own needs. And you think that because it meets your needs, it's truthful. But we now have a president who says that's not true. And Mike was ticking off of these various terminology that we have now. Um, that's very troubling. And in my book, it is part of this um, uncomfortable sense that many of us have. One, that there is a lot going on now. Not only that's going, that we cannot control. Things are happening all over the place that we can't control. That we're losing our ability to feel comfortable determining our own future. Um, and, then, and then what happens in history, there are many examples of this, then what happens is that you search for that person who's going to provide the answers for you. Um, remember, it was, it was Donald Trump at the Republican National Convention in the summer of 2016 who said, I am the only one who can answer these questions and who can lead you. Really? How interesting. Based on what, sir? Based on what? And those kind of simple questions don't get asked today. You get into long, complicated type of questions. There are fundamental issues that ought to be asked and addressed, and we don't do it. There's another question here. So we'll take these Ray, two. Ray, you next. Right. <laughs> I did have a question just trying to put together all the things we've been discussing. On one hand, you, you mentioned the fires in California, the hurricanes, the floods, all the indications of climate change that those of us who have been old enough have been hearing about and our role in it and have tried and then seen so many people try to say, oh, that's not true and it's not happening, but it's in your face in, in so many ways in, in a sense of a, a catastrophe that's facing all, the whole globe out there. Then I think of being the generation who remembers the space race and putting um, the Apollo and putting a man on the, on the moon and the awe at which, what was it, 20 some human beings who <coughs> went into space and saw Earth rise and saw this tiny little globe diamond out there in, in, in the, the vastness of the universe and how we've learned about that since then and the need that, 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 there's, that there are no borders and that you can see the smoke from, like the fires in California go around the globe. You can see all this stuff and yet we have so many people who don't believe it, don't understand it, don't comprehend it. Um, and I look at the people like Mr. Trump and others, particularly in the Republican Party, who are pushing all this stuff. They tend to be old people. Um, and they're bringing on sort of their young minions and a lot of this nationalist stuff where they w w whip up this hate and fear and th things. And what we, when we look back to the, quote, greatest generation, where the people who did see the globe and did see the world and understood through hard knocks and horrible experiences what happens when we work against each other rather than with each other, and we've lost that. And I'm just trying, it, it, that, that gut punch in your stomach that's there, I'm trying to make sense out of all of this, and how, how do we get enough people to understand that we need to be seeing that little blue diamond out there and realize how precious it is and how it takes all of us to protect it and to give us a place on it, and then how the greed of individuals who aren't going to last that long. <laughs> Great, they're mainly old, um, you know, really old. And they're destroying it all for what? Well, first of all, thank you very much for what you just said. I think that was a marvelous, articulate presentation. Um, I suppose you could leave uh, an evening like this and be in a deep pit of depression. 
However, however, <laughs> um, two things have to be said. One is that there is a record, there is a historical record that where you have freedom of the press, you do have ranges of freedom, but it's freedom that you have. And that, and this, this has taken place and there's a record of it really all over the world. The second thing is that the election last week strongly suggests to me that there are, a, that there is an increasing number of Americans who have learned about the Trump phenomenon and who do not like it and who are prepared to go and put their lives on the line in a political sense and try to win back the country as they see it. Um, isn't it remarkable that there are in Congress today, in the House of Representatives, more than 100 women? What was it 15 years ago? I mean, you'd find that, we're, well, oh, woman, where are you? Uh, you never would see them. And um, I remember in 1992, I think, when the senator from California, Feinstein, was, was there. Oh, that was a really a big deal. Um, I mean, men have had a long time running the world. So, ladies, it's your turn. Go ahead and do it. And if there are 100 now, there are probably going to be 200 um, in the next couple of elections. And so there are fundamental changes on the way. And some of them are terrific. I mean, I have the opportunity quite often, probably undeservedly, of being able to talk to young students at the Kennedy School, um, at Johns Hopkins, at uh, Georgetown, and at GW. And some of them are fabulous. Some of the young people that I meet are fabulous. Uh, smart as hell, well-read, um, not all of them, but a lot of them. So there are any number of opportunities for the good guys to win. And um, I still want to believe that we will. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll make this our last question. Hi, uh, Craig Sherman. Thank yes, you. Craig. Um, back in the days of you and Walter Cronkite at CBS, of uh, Johnny Apple at the Times, David Roeder at the Post, Walter Mears at AP, the media seemed to be somewhat of a news uh, of a uh, gatekeeper in deciding who ended up being taken seriously as a presidential candidate. Uh, now, in the last couple of cycles, we've had, uh, with due all due respect to both of them. Uh, a, a president who had gone from no elected office directly into the Senate, ran for president without even having completed a single Senate term, maybe not even a full congressional term in the Senate. Then we had somebody, as you said, who'd never even been on a school board who goes directly to president. Do you think that the news media could still have a role as gatekeeper, or do you think they should have a role as gatekeeper? Should somebody who clearly doesn't have the qualifications, the standing to run for president, be covered? Should they be ignored? What are your thoughts? You know, the thing is that um, even if the press had a point of view as a group, a single point of view, um, Donald Trump in 2016, without any noticeable experience, was able to walk down those steps in his building in New York and say, here I am, people. And there were 20 cameras back there to take a picture of him saying that. And that went out all over the country. By the time he was elected president, the three big networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, had provided him with more than 1,100 free minutes of coverage. Hillary got 556 minutes of coverage. Why? Is it because the editor was sitting there saying, I really favor him? No. Trump was hot copy. 
He was good, hot copy. He said outrageous things. He was known to have said outrageous things. And even those people who couldn't stand him watched because they were fascinated by what they saw. So that just sort of happened. It exploded right in our eyes. And there was not a damn thing we could do about it. It just happened. We can now begin to do things about it because um, it's no longer just a game. It's not a political uh, exercise. It's the real thing. He's president. He is the most powerful man in the world. Let me repeat that sentence. Donald Trump is the most powerful man in the world. And we are all living with the consequences of that fact. Um, how we manage that is an incredible test for democracy as we practice it. But I do feel that there is um, a definite positive current set loose by the election last week. Um, the American people have spoken in a way which is quite remarkable because the Democratic Party may end up with as many as 40 seat majority against the effort of, as I said before, the most accomplished huckster in American <laughs> politics. But that is a fact. And it's a very encouraging fact. And I really feel that um, the, 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 the ballot box and a free press are going to do us wonders. Well, Marvin. Um, yes, sir. We have a, a couple of uh, nice housekeeping items that are just standing between you and the people that would like to have you sign their book. Ah. Um, so um, first, uh, <laughs> let me present you with the official <laughs> National Press Club mug with our thanks Thank for you, sir. joining us here this Thank evening. Um, let me mention um, some upcoming events no scotch in this, at the club. <laughs> On Thursday, November 29th at 6.30 p.m., we'll have the annual <laughs> Fourth Estate Awards Gala honoring people we've discussed this evening. Washington Post Executive Editor Marty Barron and New York Times Executive Editor Dean Beckay. On Wednesday, December 5th at 11 a.m., an N PC Newsmaker event uh, in which global CEOs will join forces to combat cybersecurity threats to small and medium-sized businesses. On Thursday, December 6th at 12.30, an NPC luncheon with U.S. Coast Guard Commandant Admiral Carl Schultz. I'd like to offer special thanks this evening to the wonderful Lindsay Underwood, to Scott Graham, to Crystal White, Craig Sherman, and our colleague Bob Ludwig for their behind-the-scenes support of this evening's program. Once again, the book is entitled Enemy of the People, Trump's War on the Press, the New McCarthyism, and the Threat to American Democracy by Marvin Kell. Once again, thanks to friend, colleague, and role model for all fellow journalists, Marvin Kell. Marvin, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And Marvin, let me... Um, let me give you the last word of the evening, if you wouldn't mind <clears throat> closing this evening the way you close a Cal report, because it just seems fitting. Well, the way I close a Cal report is to say, that's it for now. And as Ed Murrow used to say many years ago, good night and good luck. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us, folks. <laughs>